All right, morning everybody. Uh, I want to kick off just by saying that building uh, front ends with consistency and, and code reuse and maintainability in big companies is freaking hard. Uh, I've been building front ends for over a decade for everyone from large enterprises and startups and, and massive government departments. Um, and we always end up chasing the same things. So today, over the next 60 minutes or so, I'll share with you how I'm working using uh, design tokens and reusable web components to solve our problems of having you know, consistent UIs that we can build quickly and change quickly. Uh, I'm uh, Aussie Dev. I work for an Aussie company called Zedware, and we're currently working with the Australian government building their next generation of design systems. Uh, and it's a very fun topic. So why web components? Why, why did we go down this path? Well, for us, we wanted to be able to achieve this. We want to write one component. We want to make a button, my dash button here. And we want to use it in three different places. We want to use it in React. We want to use it in Angular. We also have to use it as a CMS system, which is always that oddball that you get on the end that makes helps pivot you to this decision using web components. Because web components are a standard. I think before the talk, we had about 20% you know, of the room put their hand up and said they're using web components, which is you know, always a growing number every time I ask that question. Um, so it allows us to achieve this ability of having one component we write and style in one spot and use in different frameworks and platforms across larger companies. And for us in particular, I said we've got this concept of our CMS system, and we're trying to do a micro front-end strategy. So our shell of our CMS system might use this blue button in the top main menu. And then we might have you know, one micro front-end for an Angular uh, feature one using that same blue button, and then also with React having on the same page. And we also are using design tokens a lot. So imagine this idea that your business all of a sudden says, we want to change color. We want a new primary color. We want to go from a blue to a green. And this is where, like, say, imagine this second button here on the Angular micro front end is helping us. So I'm not going to be talking lots about micro front ends, but this idea that you have this need to be able to have consistency in your UI across lots of teams and then be able to have components that can run in different platforms because as you get bigger in these companies, you tend to not have the luxury of a single framework. So these design tokens are pretty simple. Um, and they're really just key value pairs. Who's using, just another survey of the audience, who's using design tokens at work? OK, I'm, maybe a smaller number here, maybe like 10%. OK, so a pretty new thing. They're very simple. We're going to talk a bunch about them um, if you haven't used them before. Uh, they're best, basically a key value pair. So on the left, you've got some name. On the right, you've got some value here. So this is color-primary that's set to a blue color. And you put a version on it. And that's one of the most important things that you get out of this benefit, is you're codifying these design decisions. You want to change it. It's just like normal code. You bump the version, you change the color, and now you've got that green color. All the teams can decide when they want to pull that package, just like normal things. So this kind of process of having things codified makes a huge difference for us. So we're going to be talking a bunch about design tokens. But these design tokens and components, one thing we've found is you know, that's only probably two-thirds of what you really need to bang out really consistent UIs really quickly for us. There's also a whole bunch of CSS, like shared CSS stuff, and also your documentation that you're going to need to really nail to be able to have someone just very quickly build out a UI in a consistent way in a new project. So these stories today, I guess they're war, becoming war stories. We've been at this over a year now. Um, and we have many design systems, many teams, many projects, many repositories. And if, when you have that scale and that mess to afford having a platform team, then a lot of what I'm talking about today is on that level. So if you are a front-end dev, but you're not necessarily dealing on a platform team, hopefully there's a bunch of takeaways from today in the eyes of like, well, what would it be like if, if we were to actually stand up a team to do this and centralize all our components? What are the challenges around it? But also maybe some tips and tricks for you that you can take back to how you're building on a smaller level, sharing components within an app or within a couple of apps or something like that. But it really is more of a story around a bigger scale of like, you know, you've got lots of teams and departments and you've got some budget to solve this. And it's not our first rodeo. This is actually our third design system. So when we started it, that scared the hell out of me because I'm like, 
how many years do we have before we're one of these other design systems or sets of components that's died. But we've, we've been very successful doing it. We've got a lot of value out of it. We had one in React, one in Angular. The last one's about five years old. And eventually, it's become too limited in being its scope and its, its audience being just in Angular where we are. So about a year ago, we set off on a journey. We got budget. We got about five people, and we took off to build our next generation of, of components really naively, which is always great at the start of a project. We're full of enthusiasm. I'm a bit more jaded now, but it's still been a lot of fun over the process. So today, we're going we're gonna to talk about the team that you need to pull this off, because that's a big part of it. Um, and then we'll talk about why web components for us. And then we'll talk about design tokens and how they're represented in code. And then we'll talk about some of the tooling and packaging that we've used um, in our setups to be able to achieve this. So what's the team that you need to pull this off? It's worth talking about this if you get to the scale where you're actually going to try and influence a team that you don't work with. It becomes a really big part of it. And I got a quote here about design systems you know, being something about digital experiences and cross-functional teams in a shared language. Um, that eventually ends up being a language that you use across devs and designers. And for us, that's been a really big part of trying to get buy-in and traction is unifying these devs and designers and coming up with a shared way of being able to describe all the different parts. I'm sure a lot of developers in the room have experienced frustration getting handovers from a designer and it looks great, but there's just no detail there to be able to implement it. So being able to get a really rich experience on that handover and work with the designers a lot has been really important for us. And you often see people banter this around, saying the best team you need, you want to stand up like a small team with a designer, a, a developer, and like a cross-designer developer kind of lead person. In my role, that's what I do. I'm kind of the glue person. Not much of a designer, much more a developer, very much hands-on in the team as well, shipping code, uh, as well as kind of doing a lot of the advocacy for our product. Um, but this is not really enough in my mind. I kind of think it's great, it's true, but it's what we've experienced over time is that you also need an accessibility expert. Like, If you're going to go build a whole bunch of components for your team, it's quite difficult to get right down into that nitty gritty of accessibility. So even though everyone on my team now has done it for a year and we talk about it every day, we had to meet with our accessibility team every week for a year to get to that point that we really have at Grok. So it's really good to have someone who just lives and breathes accessibility to be able to access. And of course, bigger companies, there's always politics and minutia. You really do want to try and find some champion for your product to get out there and drive at a higher level. Someone who sits in meetings all day long with business deciding where money is going and getting that force in place. So this is what we kind of had and took off with, and it was working quite well for us. We kind of hit some road bumps in the way that we'd taken off with our team. And really, that's because we had this maybe not 10x team, but we had a great team, like totally not a problem with our skills to be able to get the job done. Um, but it was it's kind of worthless if all of a sudden you're not the source of truth. You really need that buy-in from all the company and all the other departments to use what you've created. And that was a real challenge for us, especially around design. What we realized is we designed all of these components, we had this great setup, and then we're like, ah, this other team in the six months that we've been going now, who already do all the designs and speak with everyone else. Actually, there's two departments. We found there was a whole other department doing their own designs in another space. Um, we had to stop and actually get everyone to come back together. So what we actually ended up was just sticking with traditional silos. So we kicked the designer off our team um, because we were like, we love having you here, but as while you're one of us building stuff with us devs, it's not going to work because this other team is off doing their own thing and they really are the source of truth. So we ended up going back to more of a siloed model like this and just spending our time trying to collaborate with the design team, which worked out much, much better because all of a sudden, they came on board to say, we're going to take all of our marker, all of our design tools, we use XD, we'll version it, and every two weeks we'll release our designs with a change log and a version. Oh my god, it was amazing. Um, and that really changed things for us and really started bringing us together. And on the flip side of that, what happened in these teams is that each of these silos has a business champion. And when we actually released, we actually released as three different teams presenting the one product. And everyone was actually like, rather than going, oh, yeah, I'm not sure what they're doing, everyone from all angles was saying, if you've got a problem or you're doing a new page, you should use the design system and our components. So we ended up kind of pivoting back to this sort of model, and it was really good to actually do that and just invest in the relationships across these different silos. One thing I really wish we'd done earlier to kind of 
poke holes in all this stuff. It, and I guess it's like a normal principle of design or development. And we spoke about this a lot at the start, is I really wish we'd built for purpose. I really wish we said, okay, what's the next web page or whatever it is coming off the factory floor? And let's just take one component and build for that. And let's challenge ourselves to get that into production in the first month. So rather than rewriting and getting everyone in this idea that it'll be six to 12 months and then it'll be a big bang rewrite and we'll rewrite everything, just say, look, we're just gonna take the next web page coming off, we're gonna write a button. And that button then needs to be versioned, documented and agreed and signed off and tested and all of these things that you would have flushed out in that process. I really wish we'd done that. We didn't. We spent six to 12 months. We did a big bang release and it's been good, but it would have been much better if we'd done it this way because it would have poked out all of those politics and made everybody come out earlier and realise, especially all the business people who just assumed, we'll just spin up this component dev team and they'll solve everything. So that's enough of the politics. I think it's worth talking about. You can hear in my voice that there's a bunch of challenges around trying to get that off the ground. Even if you're a small company, there's people who have already invested in their components and their way of doing things, and for them to change can be sometimes tricky. But let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's talk about some web components for a second and move into talking about that. So why web components for us? Well, I already showed you this slide. And if you look closely at this, we've got this My button. We actually wrap our web components um, for React and Angular. Uh, it comes out of the box. We use a tool called Stencil. I'll show it in a second. Um, so if you look at the second line here with, Re with the React one, it's actually like a React-looking component. It's in um, title case, and it'll work just like a React component for the React devs. Same with the Angular one, and they can use Angular binding and Angular form controls. And then we have a vanilla JavaScript one at the bottom that the content management system use. So all the debugging, all the developer experience at that level is just what they're used to, and it just kind of works for the framework that they have. It takes us a couple of weeks at the moment for someone to get up to speed to contribute to our team. So we do inner source, we're not open source, and it, if a dev comes and wants to help us and have permission because they want to solve a problem, probably takes them about two weeks to understand what's happening in our component kit to actually contribute and build something. But because there's so much in there now, it's not too hard. They can copy and paste and go through a, a merge request and they get it in. So we've had several kind of inner source merge requests come in from other teams, which is great. And the other thing that we found with these web components is because they kind of come down to one file that someone uses, a lot of our devs can just open them up in the dev tools and they debug them because it's just JavaScript and the front end devs know it. And they're like, oh, I found this issue when this happens and that happens. And they can put in a pull request or at least contact us and say, here's a code snippet. I think it's this thing that's going wrong because they're not that complicated under the hood. There's just one piece for a button or a form field and it's JavaScript really. And you can just open in the dev tools and inspect it. Yes, there's a bunch of web component standards that most front end developers haven't been exposed to yet, but they can just go ahead and do that. But let me be clear, I, I think you ought to be pragmatic. It would just he be heaps easier if you just used React to do this or insert whatever framework you want. Uh, in particular, React, because it's got this massive ecosystem. Um, uh, and I'm not a React fanboy or an Angular fanboy. I luckily get to play with all of them, which is fun. Um, but it would be easy. You could just go get a headless UI library there's one called Headless UI, there's one called Radix, and you could set up design tokens and just use React. And that would just be much easier because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But when you have that desire or a risk to run in other places than React, then you don't necessarily have that luxury. And we didn't have that luxury. Um, we have a mix of React and Angular, but we also have other things. So it, it would be heaps easier. It is an investment to use web components, but it is the main driver for us to get into this place. So it'd be easy to argue that web components, you know, some people might think that they're still a toy or they're not quite ready for production, but YouTube uses them. I'll roll through a few here. You know, you can go look at uh, Adobe who have released their beta version of their web product, pretty complicated, uses web components. Just the other week, uh, Google, who are a big proponent of web components, um, said if you want to use one of our map widgets, Here's a web component. There's not a React version or an Angular version. It's just, here's your web component. And then if you're using Bing and then you AI stuff, that's all written with web components as well. This is from the Fast UI team at Microsoft, um, and they use web components as well. So uh, lots of people using it, a lot of these big players. It's hard to argue that you won't get to the finish line with web components. 
You don't have to read this code, it's not the point. It's just to show you that I've got a file with some JavaScript written in it that's not compiled or anything. It's just JavaScript you can write to write a basic web component. It's a web standard. And you can take this simple file, no compiling, no TypeScript in it, and then you can just write a script tag in the browser and you can just say, well, here's my custom elements.define, which is supported in all the Evergreen browsers. Give your name to your custom element, hello-world past your JavaScript, your hello world, and then you can just plop it on the page and it will run. And that's really the vision and the dream of doing this is that it's kind of runs anywhere. It's, it's kind of interoperate with all the other frameworks. Ironically, we don't do that. We all use some library on top of it. Most people do. So we use Stencil. It's one of the main two. There's another one called Lit, which is from Google. And this one, these, it's really a two-horse race between these two different people. You're going to end up having to do your due diligence if you go down this web component path. I'm not going to get into a big discussion about one or the other. Super satisfied with Stencil. It's amazing. You're totally going to get to the finish line. And really, they're the only ones. This is the NPM downloads for the two libraries. Um, and I really see two things on here, not one is better than the other or something like that, more just the fact that there's this trend going up since the beginning of kind of 2021-ish as, as this became a browser standard and you could start using web components without polyfills and all of that stuff, that both of them are trending up. Still small in the perspective, like this is what, one and a half million downloads between the two top libraries every month. And then if you look at React, it's like 10 or 20 million. But it's still, it's significant and it's growing, this trend. And you can see, I think it's hard to ignore here, Lit's definitely more popular. And if we were to start again, would I use one or the other? I'm not sure. Pretty happy with Stencil. Um, but probably, yeah, I'll do the due diligence and put them head to head and see which one you want to choose. This is also really interesting. Shows that same correlation here with web components. So this is looking at Chrome statistics of page loads who call that custom elements dot define. So you can start to see this trend here of it going up. Still not massive, but we're like at 15% moving towards 20% of every web page that loads with Chrome has a web component on it or calls that method. So it's, it's definitely a growing spot, but still a niche. But I'm surprised I've got a room of people who want to talk about this niche. It's good to see. So I think the reason why we're all so excited about it is because it's web standards. There's three web standards. There's custom elements to make a component. You've got HTML templates. You get your kind of syntax for binding and all that sort of stuff and looping and or, or what have you. And then you've got Shadow DOM. And I'll probably spend a bit of time talking about Shadow DOM today because it's a bit of a pain in the ass. It's a really nice encapsulation, um, but it's got some challenges at the moment. And that's probably where our war stories are around. Um, and but it's also one of the great points of web components, but it's definitely going to, it's soaked up a lot of time on our team to get up to become an expert in it. Um, but as a web standard, it's worth investing in that, I think. As I mentioned, if you go to the Can I Use website, this is what we're a few years in on this. It's evergreen, evergreen browsers, you're all fine. Like, you're going to be able to use most of the main things that you want to be able to do without any polyfills or such. And I is dead as of about a certain time last year. And most of us don't have to consider it. And that was kind of also another big pivot point that I think you start to see in these charts of people becoming you know, more comfortable to use these browser standards. So I'm not going to go into a huge like story of how do you use a web component, how do you start writing one, and all that sort of stuff. I, I think it re they really do do what they say on the tin. You know, I think it, you know, if you're choosing to go down the web component path, that you're going to be able to use them and you're going to be successful. Um, and that really, what it says on the tin is these are a, you know, a W3C standard to be able to use just vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to write your own reusable custom elements. And the dream, if you're you know, riding down the beach on a unicorn you know, into the sunset, is that you've got this interoperable set of tools with any JavaScript framework and you know, you'll have simpler code and faster and more readable and all those sorts of things. And I, I think it is true. I think you know, if once you've got your head around them and them being a standard you know, and you can move them between these different places, you will be able to move faster, especially if you're in a transition period from one framework to another. All of a sudden you get this massive return in investment because you can just move or you can experiment. You know, there's lots of benefits there. And for us, mostly about getting the design consistent. So Shadow DOM is pretty simple. We've got this idea of a document object model, a DOM tree full of nodes, divs, spans, buttons, whatever. And then you've got this custom 
element in pink here that has its own separated you know, DOM tree, and we call that the shadow DOM, or the green space would call the light DOM. And a lot of conversation back and forth about where you are, about all sorts of things. And a lot of it comes down to a couple of different pain points. But if you run this component in the browser and you open the DevTools and you inspect it, you'll see, you know, shadow root sitting there. And it's the HTML, these, this shadow DOM tree there that you see inside of it. It's the stuff you write there that's encapsulated and separate from what's outside of you on this shadow host, which is at this point is your hollow dash world component or element. There's a couple of reasons why Shadow DOM makes things a fair bit harder. Um, it's a nice encapsulation and it's only going to get easier to work with. But you, yeah, we've definitely dropped a lot of time trying to get used to it. So one of those reasons is theming. And it'll be really interesting because there's so many people here today actually using web components to speak with um, afterwards, see how they're solving this problem of theming. Because you're inevitably going to end up with a bag of components and you want to style them, but you don't necessarily, you know, you want other people to be able to potentially override those styles and there's a balance between that point. Luckily, we have CSS variables now in the browser. And the good thing about CSS variables, you know, this dash dash color dash primary here, this prefix with the dash dash, you know, it works in any of the browsers like SAS variables would, but you know, these are kind of taking over now being a web standard. These can cross that shadow DOM boundary and the CSS can come in because really the CSS between you know, your shadow DOM and the light DOM really can't influence each other the way you'd like to just normally with global CSS, which is a good and bad thing. So if you imagine, this is kind of pseudo-ish code. Imagine the green my button here is your shadow host, your boundary, that's your web component. And then the stuff inside, your button here, um, that button is just a native button. So if you've never seen a web component or thought about this idea here, you don't actually take a native button from the browser and then extend its ability. That's not going to come to this. There's already been a lot of discussion around that. You're going to put these things inside. But now all of a sudden, you have to somehow do what you'd normally do to the button, but you've got this layer outside of it. So we're just talking about the styling side of it here, but you could also think about the props that you need to drill in. Like a button has a lot of HTML things on it that you might need to expose outside as well, and then you've got a prop drill down to it. But really what I want to talk about here is the styling. So I've got a class on this button, but it's inside the shadow DOM, yeah? Class equals BTN, terrible name. But it's in the shadow DOM, so I really can't affect the styles in a global space. And there's a few ways to work around it. I'll show you where we've kind of ended up now in the next five, 10 minutes. So if I wanted to globally style this, imagine this is kind of pseudo code. I just put it on a page and then I made a style tag underneath. This won't work for me. I can't just go select dot button selector with CSS because it's inside that shadow DOM. Even though I'm kind of trying to choose the background color of that button and apply a CSS variable that I said works, it won't work because it can't cross the shadow DOM to get in there until you actually register it inside the shadow DOM. Um, so for us, we kind of took off in this way first. We said, OK, we've got all these components. Here's a drop down. Here's a button. Here's some um, a card and so forth. And then we actually inline all the CSS. And that's brilliant, because then you've got this tiny little bundle that someone can just install. They don't care about the whole thing. But then theming becomes difficult, because you've now got this black box, and they can't just easily reach in. You've got to set some strategy up to reach in. And there's a couple of different approaches that you can take. But for us, we, re we didn't really have a very deterministic start to our journey. We had one main department that was funding us, and they had a big enough problem that that was fine if we never went past that. But we knew very quickly that we were going to probably become more whole of government, especially in an umbrella set of departments that we had. And they were going to come to us with a bunch of unicorn designs that were very bespoke and just be too difficult for us to describe in properties for what they could configure. So if you took a, this button component again with this button class inside the shadow DOM, what I can do inside the CSS for this web component, I can set up like a public API. I can say, I want to have a colon host. And then I'm going to say, this dash dash background dash color is my public API for my component. We're going to say up front, what are the things people can style inside of the shadow DOM here for this component? And this works well. And we started doing this. But what we found really quickly is that it just became really difficult to know up front what our consumers were going to want to style. So even though this works and it's one of the primary methods for doing it, and if you have quite a simple component with only a few things that you want people to configure, this approach works well. But for us, 
we really didn't have much idea, so it just started growing, and then you want to change the background colour, then you want to change the colour, and then you very quickly end up in this place where you've got to document all of these things up front that you might want to change on a component, and that gets really difficult for us. And we had just we didn't really know what people were going to want, and we knew that we we're probably going to need to style a lot from an, from outside of the component. So for us, we invested quite heavily in a, in, um, a web component strategy uh, tooling with the part attribute. Now, this is something you probably haven't seen if you're doing one of the frameworks, because it's only what you'd do with Shadow DOM. And what it what this allows you to do, it's a web standard that works in all the browsers, is you say, I want to say this part, and I'll declare it up front inside my Shadow DOM, is now exposed outside of that Shadow DOM. So I can then go and do something with this weird syntax of button, you know, colon, colon, part, and then pass in that name of button. And then that person can do anything they want with that button, not just what we've said they can do with it. They can't do anything with the children, just the button. So it's still restrictive, but it works quite well for us. We probably put five to ten parts on one of our components, and we document it. The tooling just auto-generates it for us. Um, and that's been enough for us to style everything from the outside. And when we want to do more parts, we just add more parts to this thing. So here, imagine I used another component and I started composing components in components. It's still got this my-icon component still has its own internal shadow DOM that we want to get to. I can expose that as another part. And then down here at the bottom, I can just do the same strategy, icon, colon, colon, part, icon. So a lot of people are like, ah, oh, parts are good, but that's kind of cumbersome. Yeah, it's still a bit annoying. It's solving the problem quite well for us. We're able to dog food. Uh, our strategy now is having a global theme for different kind of brands and design systems. And we end up with a fair bit of stuff in a global space where we've kind of styled it all out there to prove to ourselves that when the next design system comes on, we can do that for them. This kind of sucks, though, because now we've got global CSS and we have to pay a cost for downloading that in the browser. So that's about 10 kilobytes for us gzipped. When we go speak with all the teams, they're like, actually, ours is a mess right now. That's better than what we're doing, so we can live with that. Um, but 10 kilobytes, it's not too bad, but it would be much nicer if I just wanted to use the button and I only get like half a kilobyte of CSS just for the button. Um, but for us, it's a compromise that's been OK. And in the future, it's very easy. We could pivot to say to people, look, you might have to do one extra step to inline the CSS just for the button, but you can have the component and the CSS and be a smaller package. But most of our consumers are like, we're building this big web app. We don't mind that 10 kilobyte hit. Other second thing that's pretty tricky with Shadow DOM is accessibility um, in terms of the fact that accessibility is harder because you can't ID reference across that Shadow DOM either. So this is definitely something that just adds another level of learning curve, especially as we talk with the accessibility experts. Not, they've not only got to try and help us, but they've also got to try and change their men mental model and come on the journey of using web components. And that's because these ID references don't cross that shadow boundary into the shadow DOM. So this works. I've got an input and a label, just native HTML elements. I've got a for attribute on the label and an ID, and they're pointing at each other, so an assistive screen reader will just work, yeah? That's fine. Both in the shadow DOM, also fine. They can point to each other. So if I put those same combination inside of it, and this is what we do a lot, we just try and solve all the problems for the devs by even accessibility. But it, inevitably, you want to customize this accessibility stuff from the outside. So when someone wants to do something like this, you can't. You can't just go make a label element outside of the Shadow DOM and then have it point into the inner Shadow DOM. And that kind of sucks. This is a real kind of, eh, don't like that. Um, but you've got to live with it. And for us, most of the, what we've found is most of the time, all of the accessibility is usually dealt with inside the Shadow DOM. And when it's not, we will prop drill down a property on the outside on the shadow host to say input aria label or input aria description or input aria message error message you know these options that we'll pass in and have a convention for that and then we actually just pass it down onto the inside thing and it works it's working for us but it would be nice if we didn't have to do that and someone didn't have to learn that idea and they could just point across so is the grass greener? I feel like I've been whinging for 20 minutes about Shadow DOM. Um, I, I do think it is. I'm really bullish on web components if you have this problem of running across different platforms or different frameworks. Um, and, and these things are always changing. 
you know, even in the time that I've been kind of, t we've been on this journey, and one of the, the great parts of it is you spend most of your time reading these two documents. You're not going to be in the Angular docs, the React docs, the Vue docs. You'll be on these two sites looking at web standards to figure out how to do stuff, which is great. And that's great because these things move like a glacier. They just don't move very quick, even though they're moving at the moment, but you can stop and invest in them and take your products and your teams and your careers along with them. They are changing really quickly in a way. I say they're moving slowly, but they do change. Um, Server-side rendering is an example. Right now, server-side rendering isn't out of the box. There's a library from Stencil, there's a library from Lit, there's a library from FastUI, and there's an emerging standard called Declarative Shadow DOM. And a lot of this, a lot of Google's one of the big pushes for a lot of this innovation in this space. And this will solve this problem of being able to render you know, your web component on the server and then just pass it down like we do in a lot of um, modern meta frameworks. But it's not quite here yet. I think Firefox is the lagging browser in this position. But the points that I'm trying to make is things are coming through and these are web standards and it's getting better. Just over the time that we've been using Element internals is now in Safari, that was the lagging browser, because you were in the Shadow DOM and you want to talk to a form field and there's ways around it, but it wasn't like a baked in thing. And now there's element internals that solves that problem. Theming is coming soon, which will probably mean that we need to use less parts and we might be able to do some different strategies. Crossroot ARIA is in the, you know, in the pipeline, but these things aren't here yet. You have, if you're in the trenches like us, you have to solve them now. Um, but there's things coming on web standards that are going to improve all of these things. This I actually stole from Rob Eisenberg, who's been blogging quite a bit from the Fast UI team at Microsoft. He's really worth checking out. If you're going to dive into web components, he's got a, like a few recent blog posts talking about lots of things. Again, you're not meant to read this slide. This is just to show you colored dots. Green dots are the things that are here now. All the other colored dots on the periphery are things that are coming and being discussed. They're either in the browser, but not every browser, or they're on their way to being approved or they're still early days. So I think this is really exciting because I'm like, wow, we're in production right now using web components and having a good time, but there's all this stuff coming to make it even better and a little bit less janky. So my point here about Shadow DOM is that it is awesome, but it's got some things that you're going to have to work around at the moment. And that's, that stuff's not technically hard. It's just cumbersome for everyone to learn and everyone be up to speed and figure out how to work with it. As a dev that just picks up your stuff, it's not to too bad, but as the people building it, there's a fair bit of you know, knowledge to pick it up. So that's kind of why web components for us, but let's move on to talk about uh, design tokens, because that's been another big part of our journey, uh, is trying to get all of our design decisions into code and have this relationship with the designers. I, like, and you can hear it here in my voice. They are a different team. They're another silo for us. Um, we work with them every day, uh, but we really kind of collaboration between those two sides is a big part of the deal. So design tokens are a single source of truth, blah, 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 to name and store design decisions. Um, but I think the key things here is across tools and coding languages. So you don't make them in CSS. You make them, most people use JSON, and then you compile them down to what you want them in. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a second. This is an example of one. This is from the Spectrum library. Spectrum, global, color, static, blue, 600, pointing to this blue color. And the first time you see these, you're like, what a terrible name. Like, especially as a developer, uh, these long, cumbersome names. But you really don't have much to play with. You've kind of got a key value pair here. It's not a complex object on the right that you're pointing to. And it's just a string. And when you've got a couple of thousand of them, knowing what to do with them on your second day in the job or if you're just rushing through someone as a designer or a developer is really hard and they'll get misused. So you really need to just have great names because you haven't got a hierarchy of this name is in a folder so then I'm inheriting the parent name. You've got to describe everything in this string. And it has to make sense to a designer and a developer, not just one side of the fence. So they're a real rabbit hole. Um, it's amazing. I think I copied and pasted someone on the first day, and they did us fine. And then we've been nine months discussing trying to get our version one out the door. So it, they're, they're, I'll tell you why it's a rabbit hole. We'll kind of go into it. So it's emerging at the moment. A lot of bigger companies will be talking about it. There's quite a lot on YouTube, as, as you'd expect, in this sort of space, talking about these things. And most people break them down into three sort of levels. I've got my global design tokens, 
which would be things like a color scale, color blue 100 to 900, spacing token from 1 to 10, font size 1 to 10, and they're really simple um, and easy tokens and quite reliable. They don't change much, they're just scales. But then you need to compose them and give them meaning. So then you would have shared tokens or semantic tokens, and there's lots of names for these different levels, but most people tend to kind of group them in these three. So a shared token would be, let's say I chose a blue 500 as my primary color from my global token, but then I'm going to actually give it an alias name of primary color, pointing to that blue color, and then I have a shared token that is my primary color token. But then I have a component that wants a background color, it might make a button background color pointing to the shared token, which is my primary token color that points to my base token. So you can see how the naming becomes really important. Hopefully, I've, I've a few of you in the room right now going, what did he just say? Like tokens and colors and global and semantic and all that things. The, the, and I think that's a really important thing to stop and think about these tokens. You just don't have, you've got such a constraint to keep them simple because everyone needs to understand them in like less than five minutes. So designers, developers, everyone on the team is going to be using them. And if they're any more complicated than what I've just said that you, probably a few of you glazed over, not because it's complicated, just because I was saying lots of words, then that's about as much room as you have for complexity because you just can't make them very complex because everyone's got to understand them really quickly. And it really becomes like a balance between precision versus coverage. So precision would be that example of like a button on a dark background and I'm talking about the state on hover. So you'd have a token for the primary color of a button on a dark background when you're hovering, lots of precision. And then you can change and toggle that and theme sites between dark and light and different brands. So if you've got lots of precision in your tokens, we've found that really brittle. But if you're really mature, you probably reach that point, but we're not so mature. What we went for is more of a coverage approach. So we've got lots of base level tokens describing their scales. So most of the CSS you write on the page comes, you grab one of these tokens. It's a space five, it's a primary color. Uh, it's not necessarily a component level token. And that's been really good for us because we're starting from a crap point where we've just got CSS everywhere. Um, and having tokens and they're versioned and their standard language has been really good. So we've not been very precise. We're not as themable with, our, with ours, but we've got a lot of benefit in having a real foundation across everyone starting to share their language. So naming's hard with these. So here, this button.primary.color on the left is pretty easy, yeah, it's button primary color. And then on the right, it's pointing, and that would be a component level, level three, and on the right, you're talking about a second level, a primary color, a shared, color, a shared token. But you can't see that from here until I describe it, and if it's your first day on the job, you're like, I don't get any of that from reading this. So they start to get more verbose. So first thing you'll do is, well, which brand or design system is this pointing to? Well, I'll put my at the front. I'll prefix it with my.button. And then you're like, well, what level are they on? I'll do my.component on the left, because it's the component level. And on the right, I'll do my.ref. I've copied this from Material Design System, which is quite a popular one from Google. And they use the word ref versus shared. But they still use three levels, like most of us. And then it's a bit clearer. And then you go, well, I want to use this really precision component. Now I want it to be on a dark theme. So you do my.component.button.primary.color.ondark points to my.ref.color.primary.ondark. And it's getting kind of wild. And then you're like, you want the hover, and then it's getting even more wild again. And you can see how this can get out of control. But I would much prefer to have this once I've spent five minutes with someone describing this to me, because now I've got this verbose token at the bottom that I can't get confused. Because we constantly, when the components change, someone has to find and replace and fix them. And we always catching all these spots where someone's put like a primary button token on some other thing or something else, because they're not an expert in this stuff. So you're really constrained at not being able to make it complicated. So these long names, even though they're complicated, they kind of stop a bit of that. This is the material design component fab button for their second variant label text font description. All right. There is a W3C community group that's doing a great effort to describe this. You can't go there and copy and paste and you're finished and it's, it's all perfect. It's like a discussion group. These are emerging things, but it's a great place to start to start to get an idea how you should do your tokens. 
they really are the glue between the two teams. This problem of being able to hand off a design spec from the designers and the developer can pick it up and understand what the other person was thinking is really difficult where we are. We would get, we use XD, um, which is a pretty arcane tool. Who uses XD here? I think we're the, we're the last. Oh, there's a couple of hands. Okay. Um, probably everyone's using Figma or something like that. Um, but it, it wouldn't change really much. The handover, what we need to do is we need to say, we want this language to, to infer this thing that ends up needing to be in code. And design tokens have really helped with that. We needed the designers to use those tokens in XD or we knew we were going to fail. The last project had made a whole set of tokens, uh, the last design system and components, and we couldn't actually inherit them because they were just made by the devs and they never left the stone walls of the devs' repo, and the designers didn't use it in any of their markup. So it was instantly unusable for us. So we didn't want to make the same mistake. So we started the project, and then we went to the designers and said, hey, can you sprinkle your magic on this? We want you to get to the point where you name these the way that you want, we'll help package and version them, but we want you to own it so that it ends up in the, the design files. And a lot of devs didn't like that because the names the designers make are not as, like we have quite analytical hardcore people that think of things as a box in a box in a box in a box. And they're not, they're like, you know, more, uh, not, I won't dig myself a further hole than that. But so, but it was, so everyone was like, you can't. Like I, the person from the previous systems, like you can't let the designers do it. They just can't do it. They're not as good as me. I'm the developer. I'm going to nail it. I'm like, no, but if we don't, we'll fail. They have to do it for us. Um, and that's just dragged out in this really long process, but it's brought both the teams together and they just, they did such a better job than us, even though I don't like some of the names. Um, it, it's, yeah, we had to kind of go down that path. So we use a tool called Style Dictionary. Everything lives in JSON, which is another a bit of a barrier for the for the designers to be able to contribute to this. But basically, we have spreadsheets, and they go, we want to change this to this, or we want a new suite of some named passive variants or something like that. And we'll go in and document all of that in the JSON for them and publish the package. And uh, we put that into an internal NPM repository. So for the web teams, we, we take this JSON and we pump it out for CSS and SAS. So we're, we're not like going to pick a battle here. Some of the teams like SAS, some like, like post CSS. Some just want straight CSS. And all the different dev teams can then pull all of those design tokens. Not our components, just our design tokens live in this package and some shared CSS. We went and spoke with the mobile team because we can also have this opportunity to compile the same tokens to Swift and Android and Flutter and so forth. They were like, eh, we live in this other silo. We don't talk to you yet. But that's all right. I think in the future, as we get more mature, they might come back. Yeah, yeah. But they have a great life. They just get to go rogue. They came up with a whole dark theme, and nobody knew about it, and they went to production. It was awesome. Um, and, and of course, the business people love it, because they see all these downloads on the iOS platform, and they're like, yes. So they're doing well. So we take all these components, and we document them in Storybook. So when you do that compilation step, you can write some transformation, we transform a bit of syntax to use a plugin from Storybook, and we can have all of the design tokens represented in Storybook. It's not too hard. It's a couple of hundred lines of JavaScript, I think. Um, we'll probably end up writing our own little widgets to show these, but at the moment, we just do it in Storybook. So if we update the code, we release a new version, people want to see what that is, it instantly updates. Trying to find 2,000 tokens and manually keep your documentation up to date will be pretty error prone. So, who uses Tailwind? Really, only a couple. Who's heard of Tailwind CSS before? OK, everybody. Who hates Tailwind CSS? Oh, not too many people. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of polar. People love it and hate it. I'm a huge fan of Tailwind CSS. I wouldn't use it at work. I'll tell you why in a sec. But I, I, like in my other projects or in other spaces, I really love Tailwind. It's awesome. You can move really quickly. You can go buy their Tailwind kit. I'm a huge Tailwind fan. Um, and they have things like this. You just get a code snippet, and you cut and paste the code for this into your project. And then you've got this really nice UI. You move really quickly. And you don't need a CSS file, because you just put all your CSS in line on the HTML. I'm not showing this to say I hate. I am just told you I love Tailwind. You can move so fast doing this. But this is not a design system. And this is not good in 50 different repositories at your workplace. 
in, for what we're trying to solve where we've got the budget to have consistency because you don't need to read this. So you can see here all of the kind of orangey stuff is the CSS attributes. So on the third line, I'll read it out of class equals block text dash small font dash medium leading dash six text gray 900. Totally fine for a mid-level to advanced front-end developer to be doing this. Move really quickly, get it done. But the problem with this is you have to be quite advanced uh, or you have to be quite good at this and there's so much decision making here and you're going to not move too quickly. Whereas it's not that hard to have a set of custom components that could be React, in, for us it's web components, where you just go, well, my dash input, my dash input, my dash button in a form component and here's all my properties that are predefined and documented. You don't need to be a front-end expert. You could be a full stack dev, even a back-end developer and probably go, I did a bit of HTML in the past, I could bash it out, this out. So this sort of is our whole holy grail or our direction that we're heading and helps us design all of our components to say, you shouldn't need to be a CSS expert, you shouldn't even be thinking about too much JavaScript. Yes, you've got a huge amount of JavaScript to write to actually communicate with the back end and manage state in your application and process a form and all that stuff. But if you just need some markup, it should be like this shouldn't be like that if, if you've got the time to invest in it. So tokens and components are great, but they're not all you need. You need a few more things to be able to close this loop of being able to smash a bunch of components onto the page like I just showed you and be able to have just simple bunch of components. But this is just the form. What about the rest of the page? Um, and I said that we've got this shared CSS. You know, what, what is there that you can't get out of a component and a design token that you're going to need to be consistent and move quickly? So one of those things for us is probably three main things that we've actually taken out of our component kit and we put into our a separate package that is nothing to do with our team, that is a department team that's just CSS, like our tokens. Um, and that's layouts and grids because you can just use Grid and Flexbox, they're fantastic. But again, you have to know Grid quite well. It can get quite messy and complicated. And there's still just lots of design decisions that you have to make and mark up the page to be able to get a header stuck to the top, a sticky footer. That f is fluid across the whole page. You'll see that nav bars on the left, and then you've got this constrained stuff in the middle, and you've got this gap between these two sections, and then that's got padding, and then you've got another list of grids there. So we just have components for all this. All this gets wrapped up in a fluid kind of component um, for doing a, a layout component, and you'd jam in there your nav bar. And then you'd have another layout component, which is your midsection that's constrained, and then you'd drop in a card component, and then you'd do some stuff in your card component, and then you'd have another subheading card component, and then you'd have a tile list component. Most of it's just really kind of declarative component markup on the page. It's like a couple of hundred lines to build this whole page versus like thousands of lines if you're talking about doing everything kind of exposed all in the one spot like we saw in the Tailwind example. So we just copied um, Brad Frost. We, uh, we copied lots of stuff from Brad Frost. He's really worth checking out. He exposes most of his secret source in how to do layouts and grids and we just kind of modified it for us and it worked quite well because at this point, layouts and grids, whatever you do is a convention someone's going to have to learn in your team. You're not going to be able to come up with something better or perfect. So we just kind of copied what they did and went down that road and it's been quite good for us. It's taken months to come back to the designers and say to them, we want to do this. Can you come with us on the journey? Can you go rename all this stuff and poke holes in what we've missed in describing this stuff? Um, but now we're there, it's quite good. The other thing we really found that was quite tricky was text um, and fonts and font size and font spacing because you'd go into the design tool handover process and they'd just handwritten every single like piece for describing, say, a header like this. It's this line height, this font weight, font size, and it was just handwritten into the XD file and the mistakes were everywhere and the difference between all the headings in all the places was everywhere and they didn't really, you know, it's hard to get great tooling. I think Figma does a much better job. But for us in code as well, it was really error prone because you just ended up with people who were like, I don't know what that is. All I know is it's these five variables on a desktop and these other five things on a mobile. So we wrote a bunch of mix-ins with, with post CSS and SAS, depends on what you want. We just package it up and give it to people. And we call them text presets. Again, we copied it from Brad Frost. So you would say this would be, for example, we have a scale of text presets, one to 10. It's the text preset one, 
you go into the design tool and you see the heading there on the page and it's a text preset one and the dev goes, oh, that's cool. I just apply my mix in, my text preset one, done. We all use the same language and it all goes across everywhere. So this is a newer thing for us. We've got it running in production. It's working. Um, took a lot of time to talk about. It's getting a bit too unicorny for our current stuff, but it's working quite well and people are really enjoying the process of not having to kind of hand kind of configure all this stuff. The last thing we put in the shared space was media queries. And again, this is tricky because you can't put them in design tokens because media queries don't run in the same way like a CSS variable would. So we needed to use mixins again. Um, so we exposed a set of mixins for you know small and below and small and below above. And again, that's a terrible convention to try and make. No one's going to be right on the convention and naming that you come up with. You know, you can look at Bootstrap, you can look at whatever. Um, but we went down, we, we chose the ones that we wanted, we went through the process with the design teams and everybody and, and, and came to a subset and we shipped them all. People learn the convention and it works. So I'm going to move on to the last point here. So that kind of design tokens and codifying all these design decisions have been a huge part of getting our components to work. Um, on the first day, we kind of had it all finished, and then it's taken us like six to nine months of discussions back and forth to get everyone to kind of really come on the journey. So tools and packaging, what did we use to get this done? Um, we kind of tried to keep it all as simple as possible, but it's a bit different than your normal setup for building a web app. Um, we use Storybook for pretty much everything that we do. It really is kind of the king of the castle at the moment. There's not too much competition for this. Um, and a bunch of you have probably already used Storybook. We don't have a web server. You can't just say, I'm going to build a new component. It's going to be a password input field. And that component, oh, I'll spin up my web server and look at it and debug it. We don't have that. There is no web server. We only have Storybook. So if you want to actually play, build a component for our team, everything's done in Storybook. You write npm start, Storybook spins up and there's a list of components in Storybook and you choose it and you go to the file and you make a story because that's how Storybook works. You probably, a lot of you have been already using it. You probably wouldn't use this if you're just banging out a web app. I've seen a bunch of our teams also try and like, they're just building a web page and they want to use Storybook to describe their web page. Mm, yeah, I guess I, I might, um, but on a design system level or if you're building shared components, then it's awesome worth the overhead. So it looks like this, you've got a list of stories on the left, you choose a story and then you can, you know, configure your story to have a button that's, you know, pre-configured to be in a certain state. You can also get lots of plugins. Again, we use the token plugin um, and that's been pretty good for us, but there's lots of other plugins for accessibility and all sorts of stuff. Works all the different frameworks, React, Angular and so forth and web components. You're going to also probably end up with a bunch of packages. You're going to end up with packages for your icons eventually and your components and then your design tokens and then your shared CSS and then maybe you've got, you know, like us, we have this primary sponsor, they want their own named packages for their brand. Um, so we package that and we've used a lot of NX where we are because we're a, you know, a big React and Angular shop. But we just, you know, NX is a mono, for building a mono repo to have all of those shared packages for us, we just didn't want that overhead. And it was seemed too early and brittle to be able to do it with web components. So we went with NPM workspaces. Yarn was kind of dead and was reborn over the process. But NPM workspaces worked brilliant for us because they're just so simple for simple packages that aren't sharing much between them. Um, and then we distribute all of those packages from the one repository out to our package manager and Nexus. So NPM Workspace has been great for us, but when you give up on NX, NX does a lot of code gen for you, so it'll pump, you can kind of configure it to pump out some starter stuff. So we used a little library called Plop, and Plop just is an ability to say, I'm going to mark up some handlebar markup and a bit of JavaScript to say, someone can go into the terminal and say NPM generate, and then it prompts them and says, do you want to make a component? Do you want to make a whole package, like custom things to generate for your team? So we used Plop for that, and that was really good. We've got like five or six commands, but it's what we do all day and it's been really useful. 
I won't hark on too much about SAS and post-CSS. We went down the road of using post-CSS internally for all of the design stuff and all of the theming we're doing, mostly because our team does a lot of platform work and we're very web standards and focused on that. And post-CSS very much is tracking down that web standard sort of path, whereas SAS is just like we've just solved the problem in an awesome way. Um, so even though we have SAS mix-ins for a lot of things, we actually went down the road of using post-CSS for all of our stuff. And honestly, right, for me, depending on the team and the framework I was using, even if I wasn't doing web components on a platform team, I probably wouldn't use SAS again as much as I love it. I'd probably just reach for post CSS. It's been a really great experience. So takeaways. Would I use web components again? Well, I, absolutely. I think you've heard me be pretty bullish. I would. I would use web components, especially if you're building across multiple frameworks. I would absolutely use web components again. Would I build my startup in web components? Nah, nah, stay away, just get it done. Um, but saying that, I had to build a, um, a date picker for something that was written in um, React. And we were like, oh, we want to move quickly. And we might not stay with React. We might be hipsters and go to use Quick. Um, so we used a, com a web component to do the date picker. Someone had the most of it already on some weird part of GitHub, I took it down and just changed it to be kind of more hard-coded to what we want, and then we made a web component for it, and we can take it to whatever framework we might move to in this certain project. So I might use it in places outside of big teams and platform work, um, but if you're moving quickly and you don't know where you're heading just yet, then you're probably better off just using the framework. But nothing's stopping you from going all in with web components. They're amazing. Would I use design tokens again? Well, oh, that's a much trickier question. Um, only if I have a design system. If I didn't have a design system, I wouldn't use them. And, and this is just Duncanism and being opinionated. I'm totally wrong probably in saying this. Um, but I think the, the overhead of getting everyone to understand how they work and, and what they do, you really need to have the problem to solve, that you have enough teams for that and time to kind of bake it in because it's so early in the journey. If I was just doing a web app, got a customer, I'm a contractor, uh, you know, there's five of us working on it for six months, I would probably just have a set of CSS variables to name my common things, my primary, my tertiary, like what we classically have done a lot with SAS variables. I'll just stick it in a file and I'd probably do that, maybe version it and stick it in a package if you've got multiple repositories. Um, because design tokens are a pretty big step, I think, to take to have another tool to package those design tokens and a language and all that sort of stuff. But if you're at that point, then they're pretty good. Last thing I'll say, I always say at every project, I wish we'd gotten into production quicker. I'd really challenge you not to rewrite your design system like we've done. I would say just grab the next web page coming off, grab the first component that you can do, and force the department and everyone to come out of the woodwork and agree that you're going to be allowed to do it. So in summary, we had a look at the team you need to pull this off. We had a look at why web components are awesome, and design tokens are code. Um, and we looked at a bunch of tools and packaging we used. I know it's quite a bespoke little area, this, um, but just want to say thanks for letting me share my story. Um, I know that we have a party this evening here tonight. It's a very geeky topic. I, I know there's a bunch of people in here doing a similar thing, which is cool. So come grab me for a coffee or a beverage. Um, I'd love to hear what you're building. So thanks for letting me share my story. <laughs>